It's uh, a line that runs through the bridge of the nose, the septum of the nose, the peak of the lip, cleft in the chin, fairly obvious. And if I divide this distance, top to bottom, in half, we find the line of the eyes. If I add a little to the top of that, we find the brow, the brow bone. Then if I divide this distance and to the base of the chin in half, we find, ge in general, where the bottom of the nose would fall. And then if I divide that distance and the chin in half, on average, we find where the bottom of the lower lip would fall. And it doesn't matter. I think maybe you need to, let's see, help this. Now oh, that looks pretty good. Not getting too much distortion. And since not everybody's proportions, in fact, almost nobody's proportions are precisely these, um, don't, not everyone's conformed to these, that doesn't even matter. Because you can use this measurement system as a means of comparing how an individual's head and features would actually vary from the average. So it's still of use, even if a particular model, and most don't, don't exactly conform to these. So now I'm going to start by building the, well, let me point another thing out to you, too. Even though I called this an inverted egg, we all know that the head is no, is no egg. It has a front plane. You can see where the shadow on his temple turns. And it has a side plane, side of the jaw, side of the temple. So it's more of a box. Can someone shut the door just during the demonstration so all the noise doesn't bite me? OK, now what we're going to do is we're going to start building the features, the nose, mouth, and so on. And a logical way of doing it is by beginning to develop them at the main intersection between the horizontal axis, the main horizontal axis, which is the brow, and the vertical axis I talked of, I spoke of earlier. And that intersection occurs at the bridge of the nose. So I've lighted the model so that we can really see in bold relief the planes of the nose and the larger planes of the head as well. So we'll, the right side of his nose, the left side as we're looking at it, is turning from light to shadow in this manner. And so I just followed that. What I'm going to be drawing is not a finished drawing, but it'll be a complete head. In other words, it'll serve as the foundation for a full study. If you have questions, you're free to ask as I go to. If, if they're about head drawing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You were saying earlier that you don't draw with the tip of the pencil. Mm -hmm. It looks like you are. What are you drawing with? It's the side of the pencil. When I, when I take the pencil and I pull it in the direction of the axis of the lead of the pencil, I get a contour line such as that. When I turn my arm and draw with the side of the pencil this way so that the, the stroke goes against the angle of the lead, then I get a tone as though I were painting. But I'm never drawing like this, you see. That's what I meant. OK. Now, we see at the wing of the nose a shadow that crosses over the barrel of the mouth otherwise known as the tooth cylinder, or technically the maxilla.
And I'm going to use that shadow to try to convey a turning, a, since it's curved, a sense that the tooth cylinder is rounded. Think about the shape you get when you bite into a piece of bread. You get a, a U-shaped hole in the bread. So that'll remind you that the head, that the, that the, uh, that the mouth has volume and depth. Okay, speaking of which, when we come to, to the mouth, I'm not merely going to start by drawing the lips, I'm going to establish some depth to the mouth first, and then I'll wrap the lips over it. I don't even bother to draw the nostrils that are within that shadow. They're not nearly as important as the plane that they sit in. You can just uh, put dark accents in there for those further into the drawing. As mouth turns into shadow at this point, And if I find the corner of the mouth, I can go from the peak of the lip directly to it without having to fuss around, just very directly draw it to it. I'm just using a middle gray to fill in my, uh, my dark pattern. Don't draw too dark in the lay-in phase. If you wanted to make adjustments in your drawing, you would find it very difficult to erase solid black. bottom of the lower lip, and even though it's in the light, the lower lip has more complexion than the rest of the skin, so forgive it some but not as dark as the shadows. Okay, beneath the lower teeth and lip, we have the turning under of the tooth cylinder. Therefore, a shadow is cast. And we get a shape something like this.
Okay, we've worked our way now down to the base of the jaw at the chin. And let's now go back to the main horizontal axis and compare the spacing and placing of the features there. No need to draw a dark tone on the side of the nose here. There are no lines in nature, just planes. And there's no shadow on that side of the head. It would defy the light source if there were. OK, we're going to pick up now the shape and angle of the eyebrow and brow bone. Now, even though the edges of some of these forms I'm drawing are soft and others are hard, all the shapes are, not, are still very distinct and clear. You want clarity in your drawing. You can see clearly where the side plane of the nose comes up against the front of the facial mass. And in general, if you were to take a plumb line from the wing of the nose directly above it, in the full view head, the front view, you would find the tear ducts. And once you found the tear duct, you know where there's an eye, so it's useful. Now we'll go ahead and build the forms of the eye socket. Would you close your eyes for a moment, please? What you'll notice when the eyes are closed and you're not as confused by lashes and irises and so on is that although he doesn't have very extremely deep set eye sockets, you can still see very clearly the turning of the form of the eye and the muscle above it and surrounding it, and of the, of the, uh, well, that's it. <laughs> okay, you can open your eyes now. Next thing we're going to look for is the angle of how the brow and the orbicularis oculi muscle overlap the form of the eye. It's also useful at this stage to make a judgment about the distance from the base of his nose to the bottom of the eye socket. Usually that's about halfway from the brow bone to the base of the nose. This may vary. This is a cast shadow from the brow. 
And in form lighting, or spotlighting like this, cast shadows tend to have hard edges. You can all see the cast shadow under his nose and how distinct the edge of that shadow is. Now we'll go ahead and define more clearly just how the eye is overlapped by the muscle and the lid beneath it. Now we can see the shape of the iris. And this should look like a cross section of a perfect circle. And don't try to draw one eye and then go on to the ear and come back later to draw the other eye. That's a dangerous game. Catch light, if it's evident, should be kept small and not too fuzzy, or it'll just look like a cataract. So it is a reflection of the light source on a moist surface, so it's something of a pinpoint. top plane of his uh, lower lid, of his lower eyelid, is catching light. And so, we're rather not drawing it, but we're drawing the front plane of that lower eyelid. And then we find where the eye socket rests on the cheekbone and indicate that shape. It has a rather firm edge, too, because it sits squarely on the cheekbone.
Now, let's find the distance from the eye socket to the temple. And use your best guesstimate. Here, on this side of the head, we run right up against a shadow. And then, the shape of the hair, as it frames the cranium. And he has a nice graphic hair shape. Find the highest point on the head. The cheekbone. We're probably going to go about five to ten minutes longer the first night. So we're going to talk quite a bit. And you can take a 10 minute break after this. Are you comfortable? Sure, that's fine. All right. <coughs> And then the cheek gives way to what we know as the muzzle. And that's a group of muscles that fill out the cavity between the cheekbones, or the zygomatic arches, and the tooth cylinder. Since the muscles coming from the cheek, in general, terminate at the at the mouth. And there's a relationship, something like this, that's involved. See that the cheeks behind the bony part. They sit behind that arc? Hmm? The cheekbones sit behind that arc? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so we've got that. And now, if this is the cheekbone, we want to find the jaw behind, beneath it. And we want to get a sense that the cheekbone overlaps the jaw. Now let's switch over here on the shadow side of his head and find the same symmetrical forms. It probably is true that in most cases the two sides of a person's head are not perfectly symmetrical. 
but that's for statisticians or somebody to care about. Artists, generally, unless they're trying to really draw something eccentric, disregard that fact. Where does the shadow turn here on the chin? Right in there. And now it remains merely to connect the corner of the jaw with the side plane of the chin. varying not just the edges of the strokes, but also the angularity or curvature of them. Line up the ear relative to the eye and nose. And because he is above my eye level, in other words, my eye is lower than his where I sit, <coughs> the ear no longer lines up with the brow and the base of the nose but is instead, relative to them, lower down. And that gives us then just the several shapes here which we want to simplify and not really focus the eye on the ear. I mean, we want to focus the viewer's eye on the other features of the head. So I'll keep detail to a minimum in the ear. The silhouette of the head <clears throat> has a slight softness to it, being hair. And the hair has some very evident planes, too, such as this turning under of the sweep of hair above his forehead. leaves us with a crest of light where this plane meets the other and is reflecting back the source of light. And although he has brown hair, shadows on the hair go almost black, but I resist drawing with a tone much darker than this at this stage. Again, should I want to make a change, I need to be able to do it, and needed erasers are only so strong. Not drawing the texture of the hair, except on the outside edge where I soften it. I'm drawing the planes of the hair. 
can add texture on top of form any time, but form is always more important than texture. Texture without form, meaningless. At least if you want to give the impression of a three-dimensional form on a two-dimensional surface, and that's my intention. Okay, this side of his head, even in the light pattern, is receiving somewhat less light. It's less direct than the light on the right side of my page. So I'm just giving it ever so light a half tone. and the bottom of the head, too. <clears throat> Just as though it were, in fact, an egg in space. Light coming here. That's what would happen. OK, now to complete the drawing. I don't want to see heads without necks. It's always kind of grotesque. So we want to pick up the angle of the neck. What is the shoulder line? On a line with the chin, we pick up the axis of his shoulder. And on this side, the same thing. He's got a very, it's nice that he's got a little lean to the pose, because otherwise it would be perfectly symmetrical. And that's not as interesting. There's a cast shadow over the neck. We can frame it with the collar. and the shadow under the collar. shadow can be completed and included as part of your dark pattern, just as the shadows on his head are. And this is a pretty good way of finishing off the drawing, because it creates an interesting yet, without having to draw all the way out 
to the corners of the page. Finally, the cast shadow <coughs> over his neck, which becomes less hard-edged and softer, of course, the farther it descends away from his jaw. And then you go ahead and learn to put down a flat tone with whatever medium you're using. If it's watercolor or airbrush, it doesn't matter. We're just going to finish off filling in that sh cast shadow on the neck, and you'll have the lay-in stage for a long study. I would use black, dark gray, light gray, and white to complete the drawing. And I'll show one small area of this before we stop. Past shadows generally are darker slightly than form shadows, so I'll begin to develop that aspect here. We can also see that areas that are receiving less reflected light, that are very recessed for instance, like the corners of the mouth, can go darker. As you would proceed with the study, you would want to clean up what you've done and refine and design what you've done. Don't just try to add detail upon detail. Check to see if you've got the eyes and the small shapes around them correct. And certainly, among the darkest areas would be the shadows, as I said earlier, in his hair. So you want to indicate those.
Okay, and then you would just proceed to refine it for the remainder of the period. Okay, thanks, Bob.